Thank you and welcome to this talk. This talk is about Angular and architecture. And as mentioned, I am Manfred. I'm a trainer and consultant. I have even a slide for this. And I'm doing a lot of consultancy as well as in-house uh, trainings with companies, mainly in Germany, sometimes in Austria and other parts of Europe. I'm also part of the Google Developer Expert program and I'm quite proud of this. And I want to start, thank you, <laughs> I want to start this presentation with a question. Who of you had ever the pleasure of starting a new project from the scratch? Oh, nice, nice. It's a nice experience. Uh, at least in my uh, past, it was ever a nice experience. At the first day, your project looks like this. It is a green field with all those possibilities. Everything can happen here. And then after some weeks, it looks like this. It is very cute, as you see. It does exactly what it is supposed to do. But after some years, it exactly looks like this guy here. And no, this isn't me at college. This is the Frankenstein monster. You know the Frankenstein monster, this monster that was assembled of different body parts of different people. And this is exactly what happens when we don't care about architecture. We are adding one body part after the other one. We are adding one use case after the other one. We are adding several libraries and perhaps frameworks and maintaining such a system is really difficult. And this is exactly what this talk is about. In this talk, I want to give you three ideas of how to avoid such a Frankenstein monster within your projects. I will start with something that is quite obvious. I will start with NBM packages. And then I will move on to the mono repo repository that is quite common nowadays in the area of Angular development. And as a third point, I will speak about micro apps, micro apps, microservices, micro frontends, as you want to call them. And of course, at the end, I will give you some guidance upon how to choose the right solution for, for your very uh, special needs for your projects and so on. So first things first, let's start with the NBM package approach. The idea behind this is to subdivide a big system into tinier parts. And each part could be an NBM package that is installed on demand and integrated into your overall architecture. And here I have a good message for you. Perhaps you have seen it. Since about six months, using NBM packages, especially creating NBM packages, has been built in into the CLI. Using the CLI 6 and above, it's really easy to do something like this. Everything you do is newing up a new project and then of course you can move into this project and in addition to that, and this is the new point, you can create a sub-project. And this sub-project here is a library, a flight booking library that cares about a specific use case in my overall application. In addition to that, you can add further applications. For instance, this playground application here, I'm using to test my library. To execute my playground application, I can serve it with this project switch. And then when everything is good, I can Angie build my library. And this is creating everything you need to publish something using an NBM registry, like the registry out there, or a registry that is installed in your company. And for publishing your stuff, you know, you can just leverage this NBM publish command. You will, for instance, append your company internal registry for this. It is really nowadays as simple as that. In former days, it was a bit more complicated. And this way of subdividing a project has several advantages. One advantage is you can easily distribute your source code amongst your colleagues. You just publish it to the NBM registry and your colleagues can make use of it. Another advantage is you're getting versioning out of the box. Every time you publish your package, you have to assign a new version. And so your customers can decide upon 
better to go with the current version or with an older version for reasons of compatibility, for instance. Those are the advantages. But of course, there are also some disadvantages and I have placed those disadvantages on the next slide. You can find them here. So as it turns out, all those advantages are also disadvantages. Let me elaborate a bit about this. When it comes to distribution, it is somehow annoying when you have to distribute your source code within one project using an NBM registry. Just imagine how this would look like. First of all, as the library developer, you would implement your library. You would assign a new version, you would test it, and after this you would publish it to the NBM registry. And then you are changing the role, then you are the application developer, you would NBM install the package, you would integrate the package into your application, and of course you will find a bug, won't you? And then one more time you have to switch roles, you are the library author again, you will uh, fix the bug, you will publish a new version, and so on and so forth. So as you have seen in this little role play, it is really annoying to use an NBM registry within one project. Another advantage that could be a disadvantage is versioning. Because versioning means that there are old versions out there. And this means you can have version conflicts. And somehow, especially when it just comes to one project, you want to force everyone into using the newest version. This is not necessarily true when you want to share your source code with other projects, but when it comes to one big project, everyone should normally use the same, exactly the same version. And this is exactly where the second approach comes in I want to talk about today. The second approach is called a monorepo approach, or to say it's more precise, monorepos. A monorepo is just a folder structure like this that is checked into your source control. And as you see here, you have a big projects folder, and this projects folder contains a lot of sub-projects. Each and every sub-project goes in one of those sub-folders here. That means everything is put together. The best thing about this monorepo approach is that you have this node modules folder here. You have only one of those node modules folders. That means each and every sub-project is using exactly the same version of your dependencies, exactly the same version of Angular, of Bootstrap, and of all the other dependencies. Just imagine what would happen if you used Angular 5 here and Angular 7 there. And then imagine that you are using those sub-projects together. I guarantee you, hell would break loose if this was the case. Here we are good, we are, here we are on the safe side, because we are forced into using exactly the same versions of all dependencies. And this is the first advantage I have here. Everyone uses the latest versions, but not only of your dependencies, but also of your other projects because the other projects, the other sub-projects, are just in the folder next to yours. You just have to do something like, you know, point, point, slash, project name, slash, this file, or that file, and you get the newest stuff from the other parts of your software. And of course, as mentioned, we don't end up having version conflicts. Another advantage is you don't have the burden of distributing libraries. You just need to create a new folder, and that's it. That's really a piece of cake, if you ask me. And there is a lot of experience out there with this approach. Google is using it quite heavily. Facebook is also using it quite heavily. And in some areas of software development, it is also the default solution for about two decades. Who of you is using .NET or Visual Studio? Yeah, some of you. In this case, you know this solution. Uh, the world of .NET is calling this a Visual Studio solution, which is nothing else than a big folder that contains sub-projects belonging together. 
or who of you had to use Eclipse so far? Yeah, some of you. Also in Eclipse, there is the notation of a workspace, which is just a big folder with subprojects. The best thing about this mono repo approach is that it isn't a one-way street. You can move back and forth very easily. Just imagine this here is your mono repository, a quite simple mono repository. And let's say the source code here is quite major. We've worked on this for half a year or something like that. When you wanted to share your validation library with the rest of the world or with other project teams, you could very easily take it out and put it as an NPM module into an NPM registry. And doing so, other project teams or even other people around the world could make use of it. To be honest, this is exactly how Angular is built. They are building Angular within a mono repository. That means they are testing everything together. This makes sure that Angular 6 works seamlessly with Angular Form 6 and Angular Common 6 and Angular Core 6 and Angular Router 6 and so on and so forth. And when they are done, they just publish it to an NPM registry for the rest of us and we are then just uh, NPM installing it. So you have all the possibilities, even though you are starting with a mono repo structure. If you like this idea of the mono repo, I want to encourage you to have a look at NX. NX is what I'm calling the sugar dip on top of the Angular CLI. NX is extending the Angular CLI with very nice additional features and most of them are quite in handy when it comes to mono repos. I want you just to see one of those features. One of them is a possibility to display your project structure in a graphical way. That means you can display which subproject is accessing which other subprojects. And this is quite important when you want to prevent this Frankenstein monster. Because when each and every library of your system is accessing each and every other library, you have a mess, you have a big ball of mud. Because in this case, you cannot exchange anything because everything else depends on it. It is just one feature that helps with mono repos within this novel NX toolkit. So we now have a lot of advantages. We don't have the burden with distributing libraries. We don't end up with version conflicts. And we finally managed to subdivide a big project into tiny parts. This is the advantage, but there are also some disadvantages. And you will find them one more time on the next slide. You will find them here. So one more time, it turns out that all those advantages are also disadvantages because having a lot of subprojects is also a disadvantage when they talk to each other. And normally they do. And talking to each other is an issue because every time one component of your system talks to another part of the system, you are creating a contract. And contracts are hard to change. If you don't believe me, just try it out in the next break. Just try to change your renting contract immediately or your marriage contract. You will find out it is not easy at all. Changing a contract involves a lot of discussions. It uh, uh, involves finding new solutions and perhaps you have to find an intermediate solution. It also takes some time to get there to adopt the real world to the new solution in the new contract. So somehow this is a pity. This is especially a pity when you have several teams because that means those teams need to coordinate each other. And that means they have to do a lot of meetings and sometimes you have the impression that you are spending more time with meetings than with producing source code. And you know it, in big companies this very often ends up in political discussions. It is very often about company politics. Another thing you are decreasing here is maintainability. 
You cannot easily change something because the other team might depend on it. And that means that you are ending up just with one architecture and just with one framework. And having just one architecture, having just one framework, going with such a one-size-fits-all solution is really a pity when it comes to long-term projects. Especially business projects have to be maintained for 10 or 15 years. And in the course of 10 or 15 years, a lot of things can show up new technologies, new use cases, and perhaps you need a completely different architecture for the use case that shows up in seven years. And this approach here, of course, is taking out a lot of flexibility. And this leads me to the third approach I want to speak about today. It's about micro apps. The idea of micro apps is quite simple, and it is everything but new. The idea is not to write a big system. Instead of this, you are writing several tiny systems that don't need to interact with each other. Or if they need to interact, then very seldomly. So you have self-contained systems that can be created by self-contained archaic teams. In the back end, this approach is quite common nowadays. Everyone is speaking about it. They are calling it microservices. When you take this approach and put it to the area of front-end development, you have something like a micro-app or micro-front-ends. This is how we are calling it today. And of course, this brings a lot of advantages. We are minimizing the amount of contracts we have. We can do a separate deployment as well as a separate development in each order. And you can mix and match technologies as well as mix and match architectures. Each tiny micro application can have its own technology stack and its own architecture, or to put it in another way, you can use the best technology decisions for each of your tiny applications. And now, of course, the question is how to implement such a thing. And one answer would be, <coughs> one answer would be to go with hyperlinks. This is the simplest approach. And I think hyperlinks are quite a valid solution. I mean, hyperlinks are here for about 20 years. And to be honest, I have never ever heard someone to say a bad word about hyperlinks. In this case, you would end up having several single page applications and they would point to each other by means of hyperlinks. This is something like Google is doing. Of course, as mentioned, Google is using the mono repo approach quite heavily. But besides this, when you look at the Google suite, you have several applications, and those applications are dealing with almost one use case. And when you need another use case, when you need another application, you are following links within this menu here. So you could switch over to Google Docs or to Google Sheets and so on and so forth. The advantage of this is it is quite simple, but one disadvantage is you will lose state. Every time you are moving over to another application, you will lose your state. And you need to load a new application, and this is exactly what we wanted to prevent when we've invented single page applications. But as it turns out, for some scenarios like a product suite, it is a good approach and a simple one. By the way, the most important aspect of this whole talk can be seen on this slide here. I'm putting a lot of emphasis into it. Namely, in Germany, to be more precise, in the country that is called Lower Saxony, it is a federal country of Germany, there is a village called Steierberg. I'm so proud of it, they have my name in it. Is someone here from Lower Saxony? Yeah, I love you people, thank you. you are the greatest, thanks. Cool. So let's go on with the boring stuff, uh, with the technical stuff. When you are doing this approach, then you have something like shared widgets. You have to care about sharing widgets to provide something like a consistent UI. 
And for this, it would be a nice idea to use something like web components. And guess what? In the area of Angular, we are happy because we have Angular elements and they allow us to provide framework neutral components, components that can be used with each and every framework, even with vanilla jazz. Of course, sometimes hyperlinks are not enough. In those situations, you need to provide a shell a shell that is capable of loading other single page applications on demand. In this case, you will not lose state. What do you think? What is the simplest but also ugliest solution to load one single page application into a shell, which is also a single page application? Iframes, yeah. I don't know about you. But every time I'm hearing the word iframe, I'm getting this strange feeling in the stomach. <laughs> no, just kidding. Sometimes iframes are just the right solution because they allow you to integrate third party vendor applications. You can even integrate something like, um, like legacy applications let's say PHP applications or ASP.NET applications. They don't need to be single page applications. And they provide a really good amount of isolation. That means the application in the first iframe cannot influence the application in the other iframe. Bugs are isolated as well as the layout cannot influence the other side. Another approach uh, you will find nowadays when searching for this is bootstrapping several single page applications. That means you have one index HTML and you load several bundles with different single page applications into it, hopefully in a lazy manner. Hopefully you will do it using lazy loading. And so one Angular application and one AngularJS application and one VanillaJS application ends up in your browser. And for this I have prepared a demonstration. Let's have a look at this. What you see here is just a shell application. It's written with Angular. And the only task of the shell application is loading other self-contained applications into this working area. This is what I'm calling my blue Angular client. I can also load a red Angular client. As you see here on the next step, those applications are really self-contained. They can also run in standalone mode. That means one team can concentrate on this client. It can do its testing. It can do its extensions. It can publish it when it's done. And after publishing, the shell will load the newest version of it into this working area. Let's click to payment. Oh, what's, what's happened here? Uh, I promise you, I don't know this logo. I have never seen this logo before. I'm an Angular guy, I promise you. But in my point of view, this <laughs> really shows that we can now mix and max match technologies within one shell application. And perhaps someone of you is still using AngularJS. Who is still using AngularJS 1? Okay. So perhaps uh, micro apps are one solution for migrating everything. Here I have wrapped my AngularJS application and I've imported it into my shell. What you're seeing here is what I'm calling the macro architecture, the overall architecture. But of course, when you go to the inside of one application, you have also something like a micro architecture. Micro architecture means you are reusing widgets from other clients to bridge the gap. And as you see here, here I'm using a widget from my green client and a vanilla JS based widget as well as a widget from my blue Angular client. Okay. So this seems to be quite a nice approach and it has some advantages. You're ending up with several small and decoupled projects that can be created with their own technology stack individually. And this is about mixing and matching technologies, not because we want, but because we have to when we think about a software system that needs to evolve over a decade or over a longer time period. 
we have our dark kick teams. They can work on their own. They are self-contained. And we have a separate development as well as a separate deployment. And the team can have its own decisions. Those are the advantages. And one more time, there are disadvantages. I know, meanwhile, you know this game. Those are the disadvantages. Those are the disadvantages because all those advantages come with the fact that we have to load several bundles into our browser. And that also means those bundles cannot be as optimized as with a mono repo because the bundles are created individually. That means you cannot have something like overall optimizations, like overall tree shaking and so on. And somehow you have to take care about UI consistency. This is also a disadvantage or let's say a challenge you need to solve. Okay, so far you have seen several approaches to structure a big application to provide this Frankenstein monster. And of course now the question is which solution is the best for your very needs? And the answer is, well, it depends. It is really difficult to find the answer. I'm discussing this a lot with different customers and it is really difficult because, let's be honest, every one of us just wants to have the advantages. No one of us wants to go with one of those disadvantages. And that's why you will very likely end up in cycles when discussing about something like this. To prevent those cycles, to shorten those discussions a bit, I've created a decision tree. Of course, the decision tree is not the last word on this, but it proved to be in handy to find a first good architectural candidate to find a first good decision. The first question I would ask you is, do you have a lot of shared state? Do you need to share a lot of state between your micro apps? And does the user need to navigate a lot between them? If you say no, there is little of this, you have something like a product suite, something like Office 365 or the Google suite. And in this case, just start with tiny single page applications with less complex ones and connect them using hyperlinks. If you say, hey, I have a lot of shared state and users navigate back and forth all the time, the next question is, do you need to integrate legacy applications or do you want to have a very strong isolation because you are integrating third party vendor applications? And when you say yes, then consider iframes. Of course, you will not win an architectural award with this, but sometimes iframes are the right solution, especially when you have a behind the firewall system. This is not the right solution for a public website. You will not build the next Amazon using iframes, of course. When you say no, I don't need those legacy applications, the next question is, do you need a separate deployment or do you even need to mix and match technologies? Do you need our dark kick teams? And when you say, no, I don't need this stuff, then you would go with the mono repo approach. If you say, yes, I need this, then consider bootstrapping several CLIs. If you say, no, I don't need this mixing and matching of technologies, consider mono repositories. So we are coming to the end of this talk. If you say, hey, I've liked this talk, check out my blog. I've written a lot of articles about this. This is currently one of my main topics. And even if you say, hey, this was an awful talk, check out my blog anyway. Perhaps I'm better at writing than at speaking, who knows. Okay, so let me sum up. We have seen we can use packages, NBM packages, to reuse existing source code between several projects. And then we have seen we can go with the mono repo to subdivide a big application into tiny parts. And we have also seen there is this micro app approach and it is about decoupling projects. You get several tiny self-contained projects. For using packages, you can go with the CLI 6. It's baked in now. For using mono repos, you can also go with the CLI 6 as well as with NX of Novel. 
And for using micro apps, you have several approaches. You could go with hyperlinks like Google. You could use iframes for legacy stuff. You could bootstrap several single page applications. One last thing I want to give you. Please beware the Frankenstein monster within your applications because it leads to a very uh, unmaintainable architecture. So thanks for coming. You will find all my material on my blog. Have a nice day and enjoy the conference. Thank you.